Okay, thank you for coming. Uh, so part two. So yesterday we discussed about ADS and ADS CFT. Today we'll discuss about uh, the CFT part. So yesterday the whole talk was about uh, the ADS part. Uh, today almost the entire talk will be about the CFT part. Uh, so uh, let's start from the beginning. So conformal invariance imposes strong constraints on correlation functions. And I will review this as we go on. This has been done for uh, all, more, over 50 years now, half a century. Started from uh, at least, maybe goes further back, but uh, there's a definite uh, paper by Polyakov in, in 1970 where he discusses the constraints on uh, two and three point functions. So, uh, and that it took about, uh, I would say, 25 years for this to completely settle and understood in uh, what are the constraints in position space. Uh, for example, in uh, the three point functions, uh, if you give scaled, if you have uh, scaling dimensions delta one, delta two, and delta three, then the three point function is fixed up to one constant. So I would say, uh, you know, uh, after the paper, essentially there was a lot of work leading to this paper of Osborne and, and Petko where they put all the constraints for in, in the general case. And if you go to high point functions, these are also determined up to functions of cross ratios, which was also understood already, you know, back in the 70s by Polyakov and other people. Now, all of these results and many, many others throughout this uh, kind of 50 year period uh, were obtained using position space, as is clear from the form I give the correlator here. And this is a stark contrast with general kind of field theory, where the golden standard uh, position, uh, momentum space, Feynman diagrams are computed in momentum, typically in momentum space. People have tried through the years to develop position space methods for general quantum field theory. And there is a little bit of progress, but it's only a hard problem and it, has, it, hasn't, it hasn't led to anything which is it's as close to what you would need to connect with this result. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, while the position space methods are very powerful, I mean, they led to all of these nice results, this results that people have developed generically hold only at separate points. So in terms of uh, normalization theory, you call that these are bare correlators. They still need to be normalized. And uh, because the, all of this were obtained with position space and position space methods are not known or developed for uh, quantum field theory away from the fixed point, they're very hard to extend beyond performance field theory. So ideally, so it says we have one set of results for generic quantum field theories and different sets of more powerful results for CFTs, but are only valid for CFTs, but we cannot connect them because we don't have the right formalism. So ideally, we would uh, develop a formalism that allows you to treat both cases at once without giving up on any of the results. And uh, we will see that we can actually do that, and that, that's where it's going. Uh, so the, <clears throat> we will say that we can develop CFT in momentum space in complete generality, almost as complete. At this point, it's almost as complete as position space. There are a couple of things that still need to be worked out, as I will indicate uh, at, 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 at the end. But apart from that, I think it is now almost there. Uh, but for me, when I start, uh, started looking at this, it was not so much kind of the theoretical issues I discussed here. It was more that I actually needed these results uh, in the context of holographic cosmology, which we will discuss tomorrow. So I'm not going to discuss it today uh, very much. And at the time, I thought there would be somewhere in the literature, because once you give position space, in principle, you would think that getting the momentum space results are just a Fourier transform. But precisely because these results here have UV divergences, the Fourier transforms do not exist. So even in principle, you cannot get the answers that I will tell you today by trying to Fourier transform known results. 
Well, the other way around, of course, it is possible. You can start from what I give you here and forget to transform back to position space because they're fully normalized. Yes. Planar, he said? Planar basis, like Fourier is like a plane wave basis. Uh, like plane wave basis, right? But is, uh, that is completely in the side of the spectrum. But like, it's completely in the Well, I mean, the plane wave basis, well, for the reason, once you're in, 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 in momentum space, the transformations act differently than you would naively. So the plane waves are not, uh, in sense, conformal. So yeah. they're not a good basis. Yes, yes. So it's like when you tell momentum, it's not that uh, Yes, yes, yes. Um, um, yeah, so, um, so I mean, for me, the main, in a sense, I started looking at this because I really needed the results. And then uh, in the beginning, we computed them at uh, one loop order, and, and then, but that's a, a rather complicated computation to do, to just uh, straight computing one loop uh, computation. So we needed to check because it's a long computation. And to check whether that's correct, then you need to uh, see whether the results satisfy the worth identities. And uh, once we start checking, then eventually we understood how to actually solve the water identities non perturbatively. And uh, that's the formalism I will describe. Uh, okay, so what we'll do today is the following. So we'll first tell you what are the formal water identities we need to solve. Then I will give you the solution first in position space, then in momentum space, without the proof. In a longer version of this course, I would have given you the proof. Um, and then uh, we'll move on to discuss renormalization and we'll go case by case. So first I will discuss uh, scalar two point functions. This is the simplest case. I would say this was understood uh, already in the 90s. Uh, and we'll go slowly because I wanna give you in a sense all or most of the details, at least conceptually, to understand what's going on. Because the, uh, the high cases are more complex. That would need each, each of these points would need one or two lectures if I were to uh, give you all details and fully describe. So here we're gonna go through the easy case and then uh, discuss the new features. Uh, so we're gonna do the general case for scalar three point functions. Now, when you go to for a high point functions, now things start to depend on uh, general functions of cross ratios. Uh, so it's more difficult to do a model independent analysis. So we'll discuss uh, uh, a class of four point functions, all of them which are holographic. Holographic meaning that computing using the methods I described yesterday. And then uh, we'll move on to discuss a number of subtleties that uh, should be well known, but they're not. Uh, I think there are a lot of issues in many papers on all of the three different issues. First of all, about uh, operator product expansions in momentum space. Uh, these are not exactly the same as operator, operator product expansion in position space. Um, and then uh, there are uh, relations between operators that have dimensions which are called uh, shadow of each other. So if you have an operator of dimension delta, then the shadow is P minus delta. And people uh, are assuming that the correlators are related, and in many cases they do, but there are subtleties, and I will discuss that. Uh, and then there is uh, a more recent method to generate conformal correlators by acting with the so called weight shifting operators on known seat operators that generate new ones. Uh, this has developed the last uh, five to eight years, but there are also subtleties with using those, and we will discuss that as well. And then we'll move on, so all of this, so up to this point would be all scalar correlators. The new issues that arise when we have tensorial ones, like energy momentum tensors, symmetric currents, and that we'll discuss there, yes. Is this dimension independent? That's in dimension independent. So we're gonna do all dimensions, all space-time dimensions, all conformal dimensions. 
All of them are going to be Euclidean, um, but uh, the solutions that we'll see are solutions that have non-analytic properties. So it is a technical exercise to continue them to uh, different signature uh, or different correlators, go to time order, retard it, uh, whatever. Um, this is something which is almost in the literature, there is work in the literature. Um, but I would say it's still not yet a definitive paper. We can say, okay, yeah. I think in what we've done in, in Euclidean signature, we try to list also all results and also provide mathematical files. So you want one, you would either open it and find it, or you just pick up the mathematical file. I mean, the Adam developed uh, uh, a mathematical package that uh, all of this triple K integrals, which I will discuss, you just type it in, you get the answer. And some of the more recent ones, we also gave the mathematical files. So if you wanna, you're not interested, let's say, in how we got them, you wanna use them, they're there. Um, so I would say that's completely settled. I mean, I think we really uh, analyze every single subtlety. I don't think there is anything. It is a definitive answers. Um, now, when you go to try to continue them, there are papers that one can use. I don't, there is, I don't think there is a single, in a sense, authoritative kind of listing all answers. You know, that's I want the retarded for this and this dimensions, and then you open or you type it, and then you get it. So that's uh, still something a little to be done there. Okay, and you. Okay, so now let's start from the beginning. Oh, before we start from the beginning, just a little bit of uh, guidance on the literature. So I think that started about uh, 10 years ago in uh, this paper with uh, Andam, which was my student, and, and Paul McFadden, who was my postdoc. Um, and uh, I mean, here we set up the general framework, which I will discuss today. And through the rest of the years, we went through to analyze Subtle this case by case. So in this paper, we discuss uh, the scale of three point functions, how to normalize them. We did find something which was quite surprising. Uh, the fact that you need better functions to normalize them, even though you're, you have a CFT. And the analytic structure was different than uh, many people coming from axiomatic quantum field theory was expecting. So I think this was, there was some surprise there. And then uh, you get specific type of integrals and uh, we develop methods to compute them. That's in, 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 in this paper. And then the other two is now dealing with subtleties when you have tensorial correlators. So here we did stress energy tensors and conserved currents. In this one, we put all ingredients together scales, currents, energy momentum tensors. And then we move to the general endpoint functions. So in, in this paper, we, we discuss the solution, which I'm gonna show you in a minute. And here we, uh, we, we, we gave the, the, the general proofs. Uh, and then we discuss this holographic four point functions uh, in a recent <coughs> paper. And uh, I also have worked with, uh, with Nino J, who is a postdoc, and again, he's, he's, he's looking for a job. He's a very good guy. Uh, we, then we moved to discuss non-conserved spinning operators. Uh, and still more things to come. I'm probably gonna have another paper in the next few weeks. Of course, there has been a lot of related works as well um, by a number of people, some I list here. Uh, in the stock, I would, mostly in a sense, would be based mostly on this first one and parts of the different papers. Okay, good. Any questions on the general introduction? Okay, so now let's start from the beginning. So conformal transformations, Poincaré transformations, dilatations, and special conformal transformations. So that's what we want to impose. We all know how to deal with Poincaré transformations. That's quantum field theory 101. Dilatations are also easy to impose. Dilatations means we just rescale all coordinates. 
And this is a linear transformation, as we can see. So it's very easy to work out its implications. What uh, the, the difficult becomes when one moves to spatial performance transformations, both the difficulty oh. and the power. The fact that uh, performance field theories are so constrained is because you have spatial performance transformations, which are not linear, as you can see from the right hand side, that's quadratic in the axis. Uh, so these are a lot more difficult to analyze. And the corresponding water identities, which I will show you in the next couple of slides, are partial differential equations. And uh, in the case of spatial performance transformations, there are partial differential equations which are also nonlinear. So for this type of equations, there's no general, well, there is some general theory, but it's not like linear equations where you really know how to solve them. You kind of you open the right textbook and it's going to tell you how to solve them. For these cases, there's no textbook to open and solve them. You, you really learn how to solve them case by case, or you can't solve them, or you put them in a computer to solve them numerically. So how did people like Polyakov had all of this great progress through the years? Okay, the way they dealt with this problem in the, in the 70s, what they noticed, um, they knew that uh, spatial conformal transformations you can obtain by a combination of inversions and translations. So instead of solving the word identity of special performance transformations, they classify combinations which are inversion invariant, and then uh, they combine with the other two, and that's how they got the solution. So here, what we're going to do instead is we're going to solve the actual equations directly. And still, one of the things which would be nice to be done is to understand how to do the inversion also in, in momentum space. It's not. Uh, it's not very straightforward to understand what inversions mean because it's an operation you do in positions, and once you Fourier transform, it's a nonlinear. It's it's a nonlinear transformation. It's not easy to see how, how to deal with it. So, but we will see what actually managed to solve the equations exactly. Okay, so these are the transformations we want to impose. Uh, <coughs> now, in quantum field theory, uh, if you have an invariance of your system, that imposes relations among the correlation functions. So this means uh, if I start with a set of correlators that transform, that have a specific weight, and here and, and the rest of the talk, I'm only I'm going to focus on primary operators with dimension delta 1 to delta d. So now if you change coordinates in a in a way that amounts to a conformal transformation, one of the transformations I described earlier, then the correlator transforms in the way I indicated in, in the first line. So you get back the correlator at the transformed point, and this is multiplied by the Jacobian of the transformation, raised to a power according to the dimension. So that carries, so if, if this would be Poincare transformations, then the Jacobian is one, and then you see that the this transforms like a scalar. If it would be scalar transformations, it's a linear transformation, just gives you the overall scaling and so on. Now for infinitesimal transformations, so now if you were not doing finite, but infinitesimal one, uh, then what one finds is, then you find uh, that this now gives a differential equation that acts on the original correlator at the original point. And for dilatations, yes, yes. Okay, all the translations. Yeah. Right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. And also the rotations. Yeah, it's yeah. the determinant is, is is one. Okay. Right. <coughs> so for infinitesimal dilatations. This leads to an equation of this type, and that equation is, is very easy to solve. That says that this object here, which is a function of n variables, is a homogeneous function of these variables. You can see here you have x d dx with a specific weight, which is the total, the, uh, the, 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 the total uh, dimension of all the operators involved on the right-hand side. Now, if you move to, to uh, momentum space, now in momentum space, there is one symmetry that becomes manifest. The translations lead to conservation of momentum. So we get a momentum-conserving delta function. 
And in most of the talk, except for a couple of slides further down uh, the line, I'm going to omit that. So my notation here. So in the paper, we actually use different notation to be 100% sure. We use, actually, let me put it on the board. So A, U1. Uh, So what I have here is really this object. So I stripped out the uh, momentum conserving delta function. So going from here to there, it's straightforward. So you just take, you know, the, the axis becomes the dps, the ddxs becomes p's. And then uh, this term over here comes because of the momentum conserving delta function. So in momentum space, this object is also a homogeneous function of its variables of a slightly different weight. Okay. So that's... So that's that the delta field I can see the delta field. Hmm? So if you write in the delta field, you define something there. Yes, so this thing here should be the double bracket. No, no, no. What I'm saying is that combination, which is summation yeah, yeah, so momentum conservation means I can remove one of the momenta in terms of the other ones. That's why the sum goes up to n minus 1. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Also, so here it goes over all positions. Here it went over n, uh, 1 less. And the reason is because momentum conservation says that one of the momenta is equal to the other ones. And then their effect is, uh, is the n minus 1 over there. Otherwise, it would be n. And the fact that you have this, so the delta function has dimension d, and uh, that's how you get into that formula. Okay, so when we now move to special conformal transformations, then uh, the top line is the equations that satisfied in position space. And you can see these are partial differential equations. And you can also see they are nonlinear. So for in position space, they are first order, only first order derivatives. When you go to momentum space, this equation here becomes the one down there. And now you can see, I mean, again, uh, this acts on this uh, kind of double bracket object. So that. Uh, so here we have the index. Kappa, that's a kappa, that's a kappa, yes. So that's the uh, space-time index of the generator. So kappa, kappa, and kappa, yes. What is mu, or you want it to be kappa? Yeah, that should be, I mean, over here, uh, yeah, that should have been kappa, yes. That, that's, that's a typo, yeah, yes, yeah. <clears throat> so you can see that this becomes now second order. So it, it looks like, in a sense, we went like in the wrong direction. So we had first order equations. Now we have to solve a second order equations. But actually, that equation is easier to solve than, than this one for reasons that become more clear towards the middle of the talk. Um, and now, if you had, uh, so this is for scalar operators. If you have uh, spinning operators with indices, then there are a few additional terms which you can find in the paper. Okay, that's the questions we're going to solve. So now, next, I'm going to tell you what is the solution. So, any question on the equations? Can we turn off those because yes. I cannot hear uh, one people long? Maybe in the back you can leave them, but uh, in front, uh, are they stopping? No. Are they maybe from here? Uh, no, it's okay. Ah. Better to just turn off regulators, right? Turn off regulators. 
<laughs> they have their own minds. <laughs> it's uh, say either all of us or none. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, good. Yes, now now tell me. Ah, yes. So here I have the, the double bracket means I have stripped out the uh, delta function. And uh, I still have written P1 to Pn, but of course Pn is minus P1 to Pn minus 1. Yes. Uh, so in 2D, uh, is the Virasoro constraints also can be solved? And the yes. So it would, be, uh, it would be interesting to actually sit down and uh, go through everything I'm going to tell you today and do it for 2D. We, we, we haven't done it carefully. I've done it for two point functions, it is slightly different. Uh, there are more subtleties because they're also infrared issues in 2D. So for rational safety, you could also see the decoupling? No, I mean, they should see all of this. I think in a sense, the, the, we did the general case and even B equals three are a little bit special and I will um, say a little bit uh, towards the end. D equals two is, is more special, D equals one is again special. So I think it is, would be useful to go through and think through sp the specific things uh, for D equals two and D equals one, and what more you can say, what is different, and so on. Yes. Yes. Kappa is supposed to be new there. Yeah, that, that new should be kappa. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, so how we solve them? So let's start with uh, position space, the, uh, the results from the, from the 70s. So this is the general answer. And uh, here, this is composed in sense, by two parts. One part which takes care of the dimensions of the operators on the left-hand side, and one, another part which is invariant under all symmetries. So we want something which is Poincaré invariant. So translation invariant means it should only depend on differences. So x, i, j's are only differences. It should be Lorentz invariant. This means it should depend on the square, the, the, the inner product of the object. So everything should be built by xij squared. Uh, <clears throat> now, these alphas that appear over here are related to the dimensions of the operators on the left-hand side via these linear equations here. So given deltas, you view this as a system of uh, linear equations, and you solve for the alphas, and then you put them in there. And the alphas are uh, symmetric and they're zero in the diagonal. And finally, we have this function here of cross ratios. So cross ratios are given by this ratio of uh, distances squared. And uh, it has the property that this object here is invariant under all conformal transformations. Uh, so, first of all, it's clear it's invariant under Poincaré for the reasons I just said. It's composed out of uh, distances squared. It's also clear it's invariant under the scalings because the, both the numerator and the denominator are a homogeneous function of uh, uh, scaling 4, so they cancel out. And you need a little computation to convince yourself that it's invariant under uh, special conformal transformations or check, check the inversion. The inversion is easier. So this means that uh, performance invariance constrains the correlator to be of that form. And so th this, was rough, th this was more or less the argument that went back to the, to the 70s. Uh, and Polyakov knew that special performance transformations were related to inversions, and then he knew how to construct those. Um, Okay, so now next, uh, I'm going to tell you the solution of uh, the question. Is that question? Yeah. yeah. Next, I'm going to tell you the solution for the same question in momentum space. Now, in momentum space, the answer is given here at the top. And the answer is given in terms of an integral, which is, uh, well, 
a multidimensional integral which is constructed out of a simplex. So the simplex is a geometrical object composed out of vertices and edges, and every vertex is connected to every other vertex. So that's the definition of the simplex. So if I pick this one, this is connected to all other vertices. There is a line that goes through to all of them. If I pick that one, there is a line going through to all of them. Okay. That's a simplex. Why do you call it just a graph, right? Should the graph end with it? But the graph could be more general, right? Are you making use of the fact that there are faces and things like that? I'm only going to use the fact that uh, every vertex is related to every other vertex. Yeah. So it's a graph. It, it is a graph, but it's a special graph. It's not a uh, general. Yeah, it's a, what's called KN, I think, all, that you connect all of them. All you connect all of them, yes. Yeah. But also, you know, there's only one line that goes to... Then, yeah, then, yeah, there yeah. are no multiple lines that yeah, go yeah, between yeah. two vertices. Yes. I think there is a name, KN. Yeah, maybe, maybe there is a more, more special name, no, yes. I mean, when you call it simplex, there is more, I mean, there are like the faces, hyper, I mean, I mean, these kind of things, extra features, which we may not. Yes, so I mean, not neat. Although in, in the longer paper, we, we did use some of the other properties okay, of, of I mean, the. Then you can call it, I mean, yes. It, yeah, call yes. It. I mean, every diagram, in a sense, if you have a low dimensional diagram, it's yeah, yeah. a low dimensional simplex. So again, a simplex has a property if you have an N simplex. You, you, you put a vertex, you connect that vertex to all the other lines, then you're going to get the next simplex. Yeah. Okay, so now the, uh, the vertices of the simplex, or the KN, uh, whatever, <laughs> is uh, given by the external momenta. So if you have an endpoint function, you have n minus 1 simplex. So for every vertex, you have the external momentum. And then for every edge, we introduce a momentum that connects, that, uh, that runs through that, e that edge. So for P1, P2, you have a momentum Q12. So the indices here indicate which vertices are connected. So that's a momentum that goes from 1 to 2. This is a momentum that goes between 2 and 3. And this is one that goes between 1 and 4, and so on. So these are the data that you need. Now, for each, in each vertex, you have momentum conservation. So this is this piece right over here. So all momenta or in time in momenta, if you add them up, you get zero. So it's a, it, it doesn't directly act on PI. It gives a differential, the differential equation that uh, we saw here. So if you have this correlator, it's not a simple local action. And so that's what makes it more complex in momentum space. Where in position space, it was a local action on the variable. Right, so then, yeah, this can Yeah, but, but you can see that this, uh, this, this momentum cross ratios are just ratios of momenta. So the spatial performance transformations only act on the P's. They do not act on the Q's. Yes, it's, it's only acts on the external momenta. But this object here... They're not dummy, they will integrate over them. Yes, I, uh, yes, yes. <coughs> no, no, it's not. Look at the delta function there. So even I made the mistake. Q and N is not P1 minus. It's not. No, no, no. no. It is. Yes, 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 yes. So the P's are not. Um, yeah, let, 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 let me describe the integrand and then you, you ask questions about uh, its meaning. So first, we have a simplex. And we associate with it the, our input of the external momenta. And then we introduce a momentum for every vertex. Okay, now, next step is to say that at each vertex, we have momentum conservation. So we have this delta functions. And now, for each edge in the integrand, you have a generalized propagator. So it's the momentum that goes through that line. Let's say here, that would be Q1n raised to a power I call it generalized because the power is not the two, like it would be in perturbation theory, but the power is related to the alphas that are related to the conformal dimensions. So this piece here 
is the analog of that piece over there. And then finally, you can have uh, a function of momentum space cross ratios, which are now the cues. These are not differences of momenta, they are just the cues that go through the edges. If the formula looks similar, because I have a notation which looks similar, so here the axes with differences of positions, or here cues, are momenta that run from one vertex to the next. And then I integrate over all momenta, or internal momenta. Okay. Yeah, so this is symmetric. Yeah, it doesn't have a direction. So in general, I have, uh, and clearly there is no momentum going from, because the lines, there's no line going, there's no loops that start and finish at the same vertex, external vertex. So we have n times n minus one over two integrations, uh, uh, momenta. Q12 is the same as Q21. There's no direction. I just uh, attach momentum to, uh, to any two vertices. And then here I have uh, n, delta fu n delta functions, but one of them is, is going to give rise to uh, momentum conservation. So the actual integrations that I need to do is that many. So that gives uh, this one. So if I have endpoint functions, then they're going to be this many internal integrations that we need to do. So you can see for n equals 2, we get 0. Uh, n equals 2. n equals 3, 1, n equals 4 three and so on. And I'm gonna go through in these cases in a bit more detail. This is a, yeah, that, that solves the, uh, this is the general solution of the conformal work identity, yes. And uh, to explain that in detail, I think I would need another lecture. But, I mean, the, the, the long paper in this reference is, uh, oh. <laughs> okay. Now you have to um, put your hands up. <laughs> Uh, it's the simplex integral in momentum, uh, the conformal correlates the simplex integrals in momentum space. We give uh, three different proofs. So, uh, actually, our results are uh, slightly more uh, stronger than this. In this format, it's not entirely clear what properties the Fs should have. Um, well, in our derivation, we can see what exactly we need. So you need, uh, so the, what enters here is functions which are twice, the proof works for any f which is twice differentiable in its variables. This depends on the theory. So give me, if you give me a theory, let's say, let's say n equals for spearing mills, yes. it's gonna come from some specific f. If it is free fermions, it's going to come with another f. Right. Uh, but uh, uh, over there also, f of u depends on this. Yes. Theory. Yes. 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 So they are related, but uh, in a not um, they're not the same. It's, it's not the one is the Fourier transform of the other, but there is a relation between. Uh, uh, if you Fourier transform that, there is there is a relation. Suppose this is uh, monomial, which uh, there are some cases where this is just due to some power, then it's straightforward. Then uh, this would give uh, another monomial u hat with a, with a coefficient that depends on uh, performance dimensions. But in general, uh, the relation is not so straightforward, especially if they're uh, you know, non-polynomial, if you have f's which are non-polynomial. So just a side question. Yeah, sure. Uh -huh. No, 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 it's not, uh, it's, it's not as, you cannot just get the one by Fourier transforming the other. 
in a sense, uh, that's why it was hard. I mean, it took us six years to finally understand how to do higher than three point functions. Because it was unclear what it means to have cross ratios in momentum space. And at the end, we understood it by actually solving the equation. Um, so the fact that came out to be this comes out of the construction. We, we didn't know ahead of time that that would be the answer. Yes. The first question is, suppose if you had only scale invariance and, and translation invariance, uh, would you still have a delta function at every, every vertex? Or so what structure you would have? Uh, no, I think you uh, I mean, this detail form, scale invariance would only tell you that this is a homogeneous function of a specific dimension. It wouldn't tell you any of, any of this, because this really comes from solving the special form of word identity. Yeah. Yes. So the structure of simplex is imposed by the... Yes, the yes, yes. And the next question I have is, suppose I mean, again, in 2D, uh, how, if I do a four-point function, how do I see this? That this can be constructed from three-point. Like we have this conformal block technique in the. Yeah, conformal blocks. Uh, and uh, that I'm going to come towards the end. This is still. Uh, this is one of the things that still needs to be developed further. So OPEs, conformal block expansions, and all of that. So here, I mean, says I'm imposing the less possible <coughs> input because I want the answers to be as widely uh, usable as possible. So I have not imposed OPs. I only impose the conformal word identities. Now, if on top of that, now you start imposing OPs, it would further restrict the solution space, like you would impose constraints, it would impose uh, constraints on the deltas, it would also impose constraints of the possible F, F hats. But none of this has been imposed here. Uh, okay, then another question is, suppose I, Try to do like the usual Feynman diagram computation. And yes. And then I have some momentum variables. Uh, from here, I know what kind of change I do. But what is not obvious to me if I take a arbitrary Feynman diagram with all these hoops and everything yes. that there is restrictions on the integration would come to a simple. Yes, that, that's yes, yeah. That, that's another interesting question. Yes, absolutely. Now, for three-point functions. You would see that, okay, as we saw here, n equals 3 is one integral, so it looks like a one loop integral. But of course, we allow in the specific theories that correlators receive more than one loop correction, right? So all of the high loop integrals will have to collapse to one loop. That's, uh, how exactly it happens? Okay, that's another interesting uh, project, to, another, another thing to think about. But it has to happen because that follows from conformal invariance. So is it like it comes diagram by diagram? I think I think it would come diagram by diagram, but that's more a feeling rather than um, an actual proof. For four point functions, everything is three it would come up to three loops because it's three integrals. That's this this one. So any four point function, arbitrary high order, you should be able to reduce it to th kind of three loop looking expression. Yes. And that with this restrictions, which is yes, yeah, because. He, these are not perturbative restrictions. Yes, yes, yes. This already has per the right permutation symmetry. Yes, yes. So from here, you can see that uh, this expression here is is manifestly symmetric. Yes. Yes, yes. So would that in the now? No, 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 because I integrate also over all the queues. Ah, okay, okay. So it is a completely symmetric expression. <coughs> Actually, it says that's one thing where this momentum space is better than the uh, pos position space answers, because there, in a sense, the uh, symmetry under exchanges is, 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 is less, uh, less obvious. But here, it's manifest. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so now uh, let's try to uh, move to special, to go case by case, and then we'll... Huh? It is a good time for it, absolutely, yes.
Okay, now we can view things in the right way. <laughs> <coughs> so we were here, so uh, this was a general solution. <coughs> so now we're gonna go and start discussing issues of uh, normalization, better functions and anomalies. And this would also gonna give us a little bit of uh, more understanding of this simplex representation. So let's first start with the simplest case, two point function. Okay, so, um, yes. Uh -huh. So here you don't have any intrinsic definition of these four piece. It's all real transforms of yes, those yes, those correct, those correct, those correct, correct. And, and, and you're looking at really constraints on those correlation functions, but in terms of the uh, Fourier transform of those operators. Right? Yeah. So this this is indeed. So this guy here is a Fourier transform of the position space correlator, and I'm looking at correlation functions of this momentum Fourier transform um, operators. Yes. Oh. Yes. So this Yes, so it's just uh, the, the, the same theory use, using these variables. Yes, yes. Uh, is there an eraser somewhere? <laughs> ah, it's here. Um, Okay, so this is the general formula up here, and we want to do it for uh, n equals 2. So uh, to apply this formula, so first of all, what is this, the symbolic? It's just two points, right? P1, P2, and we have one variable, Q12. And to, uh, so that tells us, in a sense, what is this. But uh, we also need to solve this relation over here. So we're given dimensions, delta 1 and delta 2. And uh, the alphas that appear here are s obtained by solving these equations. So that could be sum j1 to 2 of, sorry, so yes, alpha 1 j. And we know that alpha at the diagonal is 0. And they're symmetric. So this is minus alpha one two. And then doing the same one, you find again, this is minus alpha one two. And therefore to have a non-zero correlator, you need to have delta one equal to delta two, which is of course a one known result. Uh, <coughs> so now you need to only one integration. So this is the integration. So the alpha one two, we just computed in terms of the deltas and we have two delta functions for uh, each uh, point, which are these two. And now when I integrate here one, it gives me the momentum preserving delta function and the other one can be used to remove the integral. You need, you need QLK to be anti-symmetric. Hmm? QLK should be minus QLK. Yeah, why is it minus symmetric? Yeah, because it's that's the that, that doesn't make sense. That no, the alphas are, uh, the alphas are symmetric. Oh, did I say earlier uh, symmetric? Yeah, yeah, it was under symmetric. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, 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 yes. So I mean, yeah, there is a the direction. Okay. Yeah, because then, then it also intuitively makes sense that it's like conservation of momentum at every vertex. Yes, 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 no yes. Leader. Yeah, correct. All oh, correct. Good. It is a directed. It is a directed momentum. If you yeah. try to go the opposite direction, you need to minus sign. Yes. Okay, so now, uh, okay, we got, uh, we got uh, our answer. So now I'm gonna go back to uh, the notation where I strip off the delta function. So this is a general solution in momentum space. Now, if you look at this for a moment, then you realize that this solution here is trivial every time the dimension of the operator is t over two plus k. And the reason is that if I take this 
and applying it in here, you can see that these cancel out and I get uh, P squared to the K. And if I Fourier transform back to position space, then this is a conduct term. So this is a Laplacian to the K power acting on the delta function. Now, if you have, uh, now in addition, if you are in, uh, if you have uh, the dimension which is of this type, now if I call phi not the source of O, I mean, we discussed yesterday also coupling of sources to operators. So this product here has to have dimension D. So if this is dimension D, uh, delta, this will have dimension D minus delta. So if delta is D over two plus K, this means that this guy is d over 2 minus k. And now if I construct uh, this, this object, phi naught box to the k, phi naught, then the dimension of that object is twice this, which is d minus 2k. And the box has dimension 2k. So this object has dimension d. So this means that this object here can uh, act as a counter term. You can add it to the theory. And if I add this as a counter term, I can adjust its value so that this constant here is removed. So this correlator is not just a conduct term, it's zero. And if the theory is unitary, then this object here is just the norm of the state. And then uh, this means that uh, this operator would decouple from the spectrum. But we know there are CFTs that have such dimensions. And it's not, uh, this is not the exception. This is the rule. Uh, so all half VPS operators of n equals 4 spinning mills have exactly these dimensions. All free CFTs uh, have uh, primaries which are of this dimension. So you cannot just require that uh, this CFTs do not have such, op uh, such operators. You just have to deal with it. So it has to do something special when the dimension is of that type. Now one can ask, why we didn't notice this before? Right? That's, um, actually, I would say it took maybe 20 years to be noticed. It was noticed in the 70s, even though the, the position space result is this one. You say if this has a dimension delta, then this is 1 over x to the 2 delta. And that doesn't appear a priori to have anything wrong with it for any delta, unless you look very carefully at it. So, uh, so this expression is only valid at separated points. So x squared should be different than 0. And correlation functions should be well defined as distributions, which means that uh, they should have a Fourier transform. So if you Fourier transform 1 over x to the 2 delta, this is the answer. So that's, this is in many textbooks, but it's also fairly easy to see how to do this computation. So if I can, I can scale x so that uh, p disappears from here. And then this brings this factor out. And then we're left with an integral that doesn't depend on p. And that integral has an exponential and a power. So it's uh, just a combination of gamma functions using the definition of a gamma function. And uh, if you put all the numbers and so on, that, that's what you get. But now if you look at this expression, when delta is equal to 2 over 2 plus k, the case which was special previously, then uh, you get uh, a gamma of a minus an integer, and that's ill-defined. So you have the, 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 the correlator has uh, UV infinity. <coughs> so people, I think this was, at least to my knowledge, was first noticed by uh, Osborne, in 1989. Um, Doesn't that mean that you can't do the integration? This means you need to, there is a UV infinity, you need to subtract it. So that object is not. I mean, you're trying to integrate that object, and you're getting something similar. But that object has to be well defined as distribution. Okay. So it has to have a Fourier transform, and that doesn't have a Fourier transform. You can also do uh, the following exercise. Usually, I, well, sometimes, when I give courses on this, I sometimes I give it as an exercise to the students. And 
No, no, of course, there are contact terms which are solutions of the water identities, but the point is that this solution here is not an acceptable solution. <clears throat> you can also see it directly. That's uh, so for uh, if, if, if you like doing, if you like finite diagrams, that's a homework problem. So you start Maxwell theory in four dimensions. That's a free theory, so what could it be a simpler problem? It's just a free CFT. And now consider as your operator, just the field strength. And now compute uh, the two-point function in perturbation theory. So just, it's just weak contractions because it's, it's a free theory. And, um, when you compute this, you would find there are UV infinities, which you would need to renormalize. So uh, even though you, know, you may not wish to, there's no way of avoiding the problem. That's where I'm, where, where, where I'm getting. <coughs> okay, so the way we're gonna deal with it is we're gonna regularize the theory and then understand the structure of infinities and then remove them using counter terms. And uh, what I will use is, uh, Dimensional regularization. <coughs> Usually in textbooks, one does only the first step, but not the second one. So here I'm gonna shift the space-time dimension by this amount to u epsilon. So u is a parameter which is between zero and one. And usually uh, one does have a u and doesn't shift the space-time dimensions, but you do need to do both of this if you want to be able to regularize all possible correlators. So for every dimension, we shift every dimension and every time we have a new dimension, we also introduce a new parameter which calls values between zero and one. So this EU and VJs parameterize scheme dependence. So we discussed yesterday scheme dependence. That's this is where it appears on uh, CFT correlators. Now, if I regularize a theory in this fashion, this means that the combination, this combination here, can be arranged so that uh, it's never zero. And you can see it actually here. I've done it already here. Hmm? U and, and, and this are just parameters which are constants. They not, do not depend on space-time, it's just constants. Small parameters between zero and one. So now in this regulated theory, you're never at a locus where this vanishes. So this means the general solution I described earlier is valid because you have the same, the, the theory has the same conformal word identities and the same solution we described earlier is valid. And the general solution is the general solution with no problem. So the problem appears only when we try to remove the regulator. But the one difference is that the integration constant, so I mean here we had an integration constant. This integration constant now depends on the regulator, depends on epsilon, u, and v. Now if you have a local from a field theory, local means the infinities are local, then uh, the most general form that this function can have is the one I give over here. It can have at most a first order pole. And the reason that you can have at most a first order pole is because there's a high order poles, then you get infinities which are not local. If you would solve, if you would do that homework, then you would see automatically you get only first order poles. So now we know the form of this expression. So I put it in here and then I expand in epsilon. So that's my regulated correlator. It has a pole, it has a finite piece. Now again, sometimes, actually quite often, people that uh, find some infinities, they do this first step one way or another and then they say, let's cross this out. And this is my answer. 
That's not entirely correct. You really have to remove the infinity with a counter term. And that's play a role. Like for instance here, you can see this answer here. If I just keep this answer, this depends on how I did my regulation, depends on one of the Vs. So here, I had only one operator, so that's why I have one in one V. So that, that answer is scheme dependent. Well, this coefficient, as you will see in a moment, this, this coefficient is scheme independent. So how do we deal with this? Okay, we need... But C minus one depends on U and V. C minus one depends on U and V, yes, yes. Yes, but uh, you know, without knowing exactly how it depends, you wouldn't know. Um, Okay, so how do we deal with this? Hmm? C, C minus one is finite when you take UV to zero. Yes, yes, because now you can see from here, I already expanded in epsilon. So the, the U and V dependence, sometimes you can get infinities. That's why I need to have this, <coughs> this U's and V's. Because um, if you try to work in one specific scheme, you can, you can find there are specific infinities all in that specific scheme. That's why you need to introduce those parameters. <clears throat> I mean, in the beginning, we started without those. And then we introduced one. And then we saw we really need to introduce uh, one parameter for every dimension. OK, so now the way to deal with this is to introduce counter terms. And we know what this counter term is this one. So again, we introduce a source that couples to the operator. And now we introduce this counter term. Now, as usual in dimensional regularization, because we shift the space-time dimension, in order for this expression to make dimensionally sense, we need to introduce a new scale. This is the new scale. And then uh, you have a coefficient that depends on epsilon u and v, which you adjust such that you cancel this piece. So now after you cancel that piece, then you can take the limit, so we introduce this, take into account its contributions, and take the limit, and then the answer is given by this expression, where the coefficient C1 is scheme dependent, because for instance, if I scale mu by constant, that is gonna shift this value by a corresponding amount, but this piece here is, is scheme independent. Okay, so now we got, uh, we managed to get a, a correlator, but that has some side effects. So if I, uh, local shift, this means that the, the, the worst this can diverge is, is a first order pole. Okay. If it will be a second order pole, you will find no local infinities. So it cannot appear in a local CFT. So normally we don't put U, I mean, you could be one. You can be any constant between zero and one. At the end of the day, none of the physical results depend on U and V, but you do need it in between computations because you get infinities because you haven't chosen your scheme very uh, correctly. And in general, one has to be able to go, for, for the answer to be fully meaningful, one has to understand how to go from one scheme to the other. It's not enough to give it in one scheme. You need to know how the correlator will change if they change the scheme. And we, we actually spend a lot, quite a lot of time developing this. So we understand you can compute the answer in one scheme, then you know it in all schemes. And the physical observables should not depend on um, which scheme one is using. I think uh, what is special is that uh, you have an object, a local object, which is of dimension D. That's what, that, that is what is special. That's always, this is going to be, this is true for all correlators. Every time you have a specific dimension so that you can construct an object that has dimension equal to the space-time dimension, there's something special happens in theory. That is what helps to solve the problem. No, I mean, I, by the source, because this object on, it, on itself is conformal invariant, 
So since you're studying CFTs, all conformal invariant objects play a role. They have new conformal invariants arising when the dimensions become this. What's that, uh, is, are there cases when k is equal to zero? This can also happen. K equal to zero can appear, and you will see it as well. K equal to zero would be phi square, the kind of them with no, with no box, yes. Okay, so now we add this. Now, uh, because this introduces scale, this means the counter term breaks conformal invariance. And indeed, if I take the, uh, the, the scale derivative of the two point function, so in the CFT, naively, you would think it's scale invariant, so that should be zero. But in this specific case, when I differentiate that, uh, I get a local object. So I get this expression where this is now local because 2 delta minus 2 is k. And that's an example of a conformal anomaly. So now the right-hand side can be obtained by functionally differentiating this local invariant. Uh, and then uh, conformal anomalies, they break the invariants, but themselves are conformal invariant. So that's how one classifies conformal uh, anomalies. One looks for for conformal invariants that, um, that would appear with specific coefficients. Okay, so that's the story of the two-point functions. I think that's, as I said, pretty much was known already in the 90s. Um, there are special properties. This, this coefficient C also satisfy non-anonymization theorems. Um, there are lots of nice things that come together with these anomalies. So what we're going to do next is now generalize to uh, high point functions. Okay. Scale of three point functions. Okay, now this is the, so now again, uh, I erased it. So uh, if we for three point functions at the end, you only have one integral. And uh, the expression that you get is this type where the alphas are related to the deltas in a sort of familiar way. Uh, so this is the expression. Actually, this type of integral has appeared in the literature before because it comes from one loop integrals. This is uh, some, sometimes some people call it a master integral for one loop integrals. Uh, it was, I think it was first computed by Weltman and Toft, this integral. In, uh, not completely, but in, 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 in the uh, 74. Now one can use a star triangle relation. So we know in, in the electric circuits, one often does this kind of things. So you have a system where you can have a current flowing through the vertices and you have some resistances. And uh, the total output of the system, we can also describe it by having a, cent a, a central vertex and you have a kind of a star configuration of, uh, of, uh, of, of the circuits. So one can work out a similar relation for these for this guys, where now the resistance of the propagator and the currents of the momenta, they come in. Uh, there is also generalization for four-point functions, which I will not discuss, where you have the tetrahedron, and you have currents coming in from different edges. And again, that is a star triangle relation. But now if you do, if you use this tri triangle relation, one, uh, this maps this solution to that one. And this guy is gonna be our uh, central player for almost the rest of this talk. Because uh, we ha have momentum conservation. So uh, then uh, P3 is minus P1, P2. Now on the left hand side, I put P1, P2, and P3 because um, you can look how many dependent variables you have, and you can always use the magnitudes of the momenta as the dependent variables. So um, I'm using a little bit notation. So kind of the bold phase means the momentum vector. And then I only have P1 and P2. The, if it is uh, unbolted means is the magnitude of the momentum. So I can consider as independent variables P1, P2, and P3, which are the magnitude of the momentum. <coughs> yes, yes, yes. So 
the argument of the vessel is being one. Yes, the the, the 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 argument is just the the the, the norm of, uh, of of the vector. So this is called uh, so this case are uh, Bessel functions, uh, kind of the same Bessel function we saw yesterday. So this is called uh, triple K integral, and I will discuss quite a bit its properties. Yeah, so you, you can you can do uh, yeah you can in a sense go from the melon from here as well. I, th I think we have um, a more economic description for four point functions in D equals four. They're equally economic. If you go to hard dimensions, what I will describe here is more economic than melon melon space. But in melon space, they leave them as integrals to do over uh, the melon variables. Uh, and here we do more, more, more of the integrations explicitly. Uh, it's not so, so difficult to go from here to Melon. Yeah. So the derivation of this, I think, to this uh, start kind of dual graphs. Yes, yes. So, uh, yeah, I'm not going to discuss about dual graphs, but yeah, let, let's leave that for another discussion. If ten, is it 10 minutes, really? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, yeah, um, okay, I'll keep going, but uh, give me some warning uh, at, at, at some point to, to know, in a sense, what to summarize. But I, I don't think we can go through all the slides that I have. <clears throat> okay, so now here we'll describe why you can solve the white identities in momentum space easier than in position space. Uh, and the reason is when you're in momentum space, if you have a tensorial object, there is a canonical linear space you can expand it. So the momenta form a basis of objects that have one index. That's not true in position space. The vector doesn't form a basis of functions which have one index. But here, if I have a, an object that has one index, this means that I can, uh, with no loss of generality, I can expand it in momenta. Because this is a basis of, of, the, of, of, of the vector space where this lives. So this is just property of uh, momentum space. It is, there are many different ways to say it, but I mean, the, the, that's the tangent space of your configuration space, and the momenta are the basis vectors. Um, yes. So now this means that um, if I have a vector differential operator, like this one, this is the generator of spatial conformal transformations. I can expand it in this fashion, and then I can extract scalar equations. So, <coughs> so this means that spatial conformal word identities constitute a set of n minus one scalar differential equations. So I can go from one vector to n minus one scalar differential equations. So for three point functions, you're going to have two scalar differential equations. Yes. And these are the ones that I give them here. So one and two. So the K12 and K23 are obtained by starting with this K with one index and take a difference. Now it turns out that uh, <coughs> this system of two equations is actually a known system in mathematics. So that defines uh, the Apple F4 geometric, generalized happy geometric function of two variables. So yesterday we also saw this Apple F4 appearing in this uh, D function. And it's not accidental, it appears also in the D function. Now that's nice because there are lots of general things which is known about Happy geometric functions, but it's not good enough what we want to do. In a sense, um, 
mathematicians prove nice theorems, but uh, we as physicists, we want to actually be able to evaluate stuff. And uh, this description is not as useful for that. We can also uh, analyze this equation in a more uh, kind of lowbrow way. This equation can be solved by separation of variables. And uh, when you use separation of variables, this directly leads to this triple K integral. So this is a triple K representation of the apple for hypergeometric function. <clears throat> yeah, so that's, uh, no, that, that's how we got the solution originally. Okay, so now the, the, the three point functions, the building blocks are this uh, triple K integrals. So, uh, yeah. But of course, in hindsight, we should have known this because you can get exactly the same expression by just doing a computation in ADS the way I described earlier. So this is the same diagram I had earlier. So this is ADS, this is the boundary of ADS. I insert three operators at the boundary and the three point function is obtained by uh, three bulk to boundary propagators and you integrate over the center vertex. But now I'm using bulk to boundary propagators in momentum space. Yesterday I had them in position space and the bulk to boundary propagator in, uh, in, 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 in momentum space is given by this expression. I mean, this factors here just for convenience. Uh, you can see this is, uh, uh, this, this, this is a Bessel function. And then the integral over the center vertex is essentially what gives this integral over the parameter x. So that gives uh, a geometrization of the solution of the spatial conformal work identity. So now all three point functions are obtained using this triple K as blocks. So let me give you a little bit more information about those. So I, I will define this integral here. I will give it a name. So I will characterize this in terms of four parameters. One is the value of x, and the other three are the indices of the vessel. And of course, that also depends on the three momenta. So now, I mean, we've seen this is a solution of triple K, and we have an integral. Of course, for that expression to make sense, this integral should converge, otherwise it's formal. And this integral converges provided this alpha is greater than uh, the sum of the absolute values of, of the bjs minus one, that you can see by looking at the asymptotic values of the case. Now, if you're away from this, you can still define that integral here by analytic continuation from the region it converges. So this is the region it converges, provided the alphas and the betas are such that uh, if you form these combinations with arbitrary plus minuses, this is different than uh, twice an even number, minus twice an even number. So for all of these cases, or if we're uh, in this case, this is a general solution because uh, you can define this, this, this integral is well defined. So now the special cases are the cases where this condition does hold. So if equality is hold, you cannot define the integral by another continuation, then you need to do subtraction. There are infinities that you need to subtract with hundred terms. And this is the case. So this, this condition here is the uh, generalization of the condition we had for our two point functions. So for two-point function, we saw that the special case was when uh, delta was d over 2 plus k. So here, or I can write it also as uh, d minus 2 delta equals minus 2 k. Oh, sir, that's a good question, but, uh, is it the CFT or the beta function? Yeah, so that's in a sense, this, this was where uh, the, the original confusion came. So the beta functions are zero, but the derivatives of the beta function 
are not zero. So what you need is you need derivatives of the better function. Um, <coughs> you, you, you will be clear, I think, in the next in the next slide. Um, okay, so let now let's make it a little more precise the cases. So if I choose a sign minus minus minus, where the minus refer to this minus here, then you can rewrite this relation so you can see alpha and beta in the three-point function. So alpha was d over two minus one. And then uh, the betas was uh, this one. So now if you use these values, you put them here, then you see one, the sum of the dimensions is equal to twice the space-time dimension plus twice plus uh, an even integer, then uh, that's the direct analog of the case we saw in the two-point functions. So in this case, there is a new term of dimension D, which is this one, which is constructed from these sources. And this leads to a new conformal anomaly. So that's the direct analog of that. If you have two minuses and one plus, then this is the condition that needs to be satisfied. <coughs> and now the, the counter term is this one. Now recall that um, this is the couplings we have included. And now this counter term is gonna come with a divergent coefficient. So then we add to this there is, you know, something like one over epsilon, and then k two. That's the sort of term that you need to normalize the correlator. So this means there is a new phi three. <coughs> which depends on the scale, and there is a beta function associated with this normalization. But this beta function is quadratic in the sources. So when I set the sources to zero, it's zero, but the second derivative with respect to the sources is non-zero. Functional derivatives, yes. Yes, functional derivatives. Now, the other two cases uh, are a little bit less special. They're still special. This are, in this case, the uh, correlators have uh, dual conformal invariance. So if you, if you treat momenta as positions, then it satisfies the position space work and under this. So I'm not going to discuss this here, but uh, it is discussed in detail in the paper. So in these cases, these are not genuine infinities. Uh, it is the representation of the correlator, which is singular, not the correlator itself. The correlator has special properties, but it's not singular. So it's really the cases that are, uh, the, the general cases are all minuses or all but one minuses. And that, this is going to be the same, the, the same is true in, 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 uh, for high point functions. You would not expect that this goes to all orders in K, right? There should be some... No, that, that can go to all orders in K. Which actually happens for... Uh, it happens, yes, for explicit case. Yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, these conditions are satisfied for uh, garden variety operators. Let, let's say two, uh, two dimension uh, four, uh, four, four, yes, two dimension four, one dimension two. I, ha I had a few slides on this, which I removed, but it's probably okay that I removed them. But so if I have this, so that can be n equals first being and Mills, where this are half PPS operators. And then you can see I have, this is comes up to 10. And then this is two times four. So we have K equals one with satisfying D equals four. And then the same is also satisfied, I think, with the second one. Uh, so we have uh, four minus two, six. And again, with k equals one. So you have, so this operators here uh, have both an anomaly and a beta function. 
So now uh, <coughs> let's put this together. So usually the correlators, we collect them in uh, quantum effective action. And uh, if you have a CFT, naively you would think this effective action is not gonna have scale dependence. Uh, but it turns out when you have an anomaly that there is uh, scale dependence. So if you take the total variation of the effective action, if there is an anomaly, it's not zero, but the anomaly appears on the right hand side. But the total variation can come with an explicit dependence on mu, like we saw in the two point functions, but it can also be implicit dependence via beta functions. This is the term that many people do not expect. But it is only there. Again, for these cases, you can compute the correlators perturbatively and, and see that uh, it satisfies the word identity that I give over here. So this means if I take the mu to the mu derivative of a three-point function, you would contain a term which is completely local coming from here, but you also contain contributions from uh, two-point functions that uh, with coefficients are the functional derivatives of the beta function. So this type of terms, these are uh, non-analytic in some of the random variables. Um, and yeah, this was a surprise. It's deliberately IGD. It's deliberately, yes, because in this case, I just chose the correlator to be one JJ. So it has one is dimension two and the other is dimension four. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> okay, now we have, uh, let's, let's make some choices since, because otherwise we'll stay here till the night. <laughs> so the, the rest is, I have some part of four point functions. Then I have a part where I discuss uh, subtleties and then I have a discussion of tensorial. Uh, so uh, which, which parts do people want to see the most? Subtleties. I can I, I can flash through rather than discuss yeah. all of it, and then uh, we're gonna move to subtleties. And then once we finish the subtleties, maybe we I'm gonna go through quickly maybe some of them and see how much time we have for the tensorial ones. Okay, so for the um, for the four point functions, that's in a sense the, the, that stuff we did holographically. And holographic, you can either have contact diagrams like the ones we discussed this yesterday, or you can also have exchange diagrams. And the exchange diagrams, okay, again, you can compute using uh, momentum space now, bulk to bulk propagator, which takes this form over here. Um, now, in order to be able to compute them, it's useful, the cases which are easy to compute are the cases where this combination here is half integral. Because in that, in this case, the vessel function is reduced to elementary functions, and then the integrals can be computed in a straightforward ma manner. And for the same reason, when you regulate, it's uh, easiest to use this half integer scheme. So now I adjusted the u's and the v's, so that if I take the difference between d hat with delta hat, this combination is still half integral. So that's, you know, since we computed those in the cases I will discuss in a minute, and there is, again, a mathematical... Uh, there's no vi in this case, and they use uh, two different... Yes, ways. yeah, so I chose the u's and the v's such that uh, this... So u is one, and uh, indeed, and the v's is zero. <clears throat> and then we also actually, the, the majority of the paper, Kind of half of the paper is 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 about this last part, how to go from that scheme to any other scheme. So we <coughs> we explicitly computed the cases where the external dim the dimensions of the ex external operators are either two or three, uh, and the exchange scalar is zero dimension two or three, and in three dimensions. And we did this because this is a case which is useful for holographic cosmology. Uh, that equals two corresponds to Form a scalar in the bulk, delta equals three corresponds to the master scalar, the analog of the dilaton. And all of these this cases have been discussed in previous literature, but uh, people have not noticed they have infinities. So all of these cases have infinities and require periodization. Um, 
And then in all of these cases, there are anomalies and beta functions. And again, these are relate. This is the analog of the relation I gave you earlier. And here I just give some examples where anomalies appear. So if you have a contact diagram of dimension three, dimension three, going to dimension three, dimension three, that gives rise to beta function and so on. And you can explicitly compute those. These are the beta functions. These are the anomalies. Okay. Any quick question on four point functions before I? Yes. So you should be able to organize all of this data in terms of the three point, uh, C1, C3, and. Yes, yes. Model. Yes. That, uh, that I don't think it's. I don't think it's fully known how to how to do that. How to go from high point functions. It is related to my first subtlety because in position space when we do this we use our piece to kind of reduce high point functions to lower point functions. And then the data that we have for high point functions are given in terms of data for three point functions. Uh, but now in momentum space there are subtleties in applying the OPs, which is the first item there. <clears throat> so again, in position space, you have two operators, and you take them close to each other. Then this is given by some of our co-primaries with some coefficients, and then some derivatives to take care of descendants. So if I focus on the case for the third one, and again, uh, but one sh should always remember, that's something that people often forget, that this relation here is not uh, valid when x is exactly equal to zero. So you go x close to zero, but not exactly zero. So if we focus in the case where the last uh, operator has dimension delta three, then the lifting behavior is the one given over here. And you can see you know, the dimension of one plus two from here, we have minus three because you have an operator in dimension three there. Uh, so now, if I now want to consider the limit x go to zero of this three point function, you know, OP means this is convergent inside correlators. I can take this, put it in here. So I'm going to get this factor here. And then I have O delta three, O delta three, a two point function, which gives me this factor. Okay, so now, uh, <clears throat> naively, one would have thought that. Uh, if I do now the same thing in momentum space, so in momentum space, short distance means uh, large Qs. So I wanted to take the first leg go to zero. So the first momentum go to infinity. Here, the last leg is the other independent variable. So this is my other momentum. And then the middle one is fixed by momentum conservation. So now uh, you, you would think that the answer is given by Fourier transforming that. And this would give this answer over here. But this turns out to be not correct. The correct answer is given in this expression. So that depends on what is the dimension of the third operator. So in the majority of cases, this would be the wrong answer. So this answer is correct only if the dimension of the last operator is less than d over two. There's still a few, still this is, uh, there are dimensions above the unitarity bound that satisfy that. But a very few, the majority of cases fall into the second case. Where the behavior is dominated by the momentum which we send to infinity, which is that, that momentum, there's no, there's no independence. Now, if I keep going further down, sublinear terms, I will find that term. This is the first non-analytic term where all the other ones uh, are kind of semi-local. Um, so how, how do we know this is true? Uh, well, first of all, why was it different? Why, was it, why is this different between momentum and position space? Well, it is different because when you go to momentum space, you need to integrate over all space. But in our discussion of the OPs, we assumed that uh, x is not identically equal to zero. But now you integrate over all space, so you need to um, integrate over also the coincident points, and that's what makes the difference. And uh, the way we know this formula is correct is because we proved it. We knew the general answer for three-point functions with in terms of triple case, and then you can just go and uh, compute uh, 
explicitly the, the answer, and uh, it is what is given over here. Uh, but the easiest way to <coughs> convince yourself that that's the case is to just look at uh, explicit examples. For instance, <coughs> if I look at dimensions or operates of dimension uh, delta 1 equal to delta 2 equals to delta 3 equals to 5 halves and d equals 4, this is a case of the correlator doesn't require anonymization, so it's as uh, the integral is finite and everything. By, an <coughs> by elementary means, you can compute the answer, which is this one. <coughs> and then you can just uh, take the limit, and that's the answer that one gets. And that agrees with this, and this agrees with that. Yeah. And the same, uh, one can find the same conclusion for four point functions. And then for four-point functions, you can do the, you can put the OPA inside the four-point function. So this is a four-point function of delta one, delta two. You exchange delta x, it goes to delta three, delta four. Uh, so you have external dimensions k one, k two, k three, k four. S is the Mandelstam variable. If you use that, that should be the answer in momentum space. But if you take the answers that we computed. Uh, this is correct only when the operator that is exchanged is dimension less than d over 2. In all the other cases, it's a different formula. So, what is the expression of this separation? The d over 2 is, uh, okay, in the sense I, I only understand it really at the technical level. So, when you you can do the, the you, you can try to do the Fourier transform one after the other. So you can first do uh, <coughs> over two points, and then there's one at this left. And then uh, if this final integral had no divergence, it would be the naive of PE. But then you can see that uh, whether this final integral has a divergence or not, depends on whether delta 3 is greater or less than d over 2. Um, it would be nice to have a more physical understanding. Uh, I mean, but OK, I, I, I don't have anything better to offer. Uh, it is a dragging, it's exactly half of the space time dimension, but uh, yeah, there must be some uh, other way to understand it. Yes, it's not, unitarity. It's not a unitarity for sure, it's not, it's, it's not unitarity, it's something, it's something else uh, in terms of physics, but in terms of mathematics, it's completely clear, you can see it in the formulas. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, shadow dimensions. Uh, so it is often quoted and used in the literature that if you have operators with shadow dimension, this can be obtained from the original ones by using horizontal transform. If you apply this to um, two and three point functions, these are the formulas. The two point function is the inverse of the original one, and the three point function is the three-point function of the original divided by the product of the two-point functions. Uh, there are a number of heuristic arguments about why that's the case, or why this design can transform. Uh, and there is sort of an ADS CFT proof as well. Uh, <coughs> if the dimensions are generic, one can use the triple case in the graphs that we showed to show that these are true. But these relations here do not hold when the correlators require anonymization, and people have used this relation in such cases. Um, and uh, the simplest case is operators of dimension one and two, and d equals three. You can see the shadow dimensions. You can, one can explicitly compute uh, the answers. This is for the two and three point function. So dimensions one do not require any anonymization. For dimension two, this is also uh, doesn't require normalization, <coughs> but this one requires normalization, and you get uh, you know, this, this log behavior. So now you can see the case which doesn't require normalization. This is the inverse of that, but uh, this is not equal to that divided by the three-point functions. Is the log not there? Yes. yes yeah. um, and I mean, it's even good people that use this in uh, well-cited papers. <laughs> um, 
Uh, finally, weight shifting operators. Um, <coughs> so this is a fairly recent development, going back to uh, 2017 by Simon Staffin and collaborators. Um, so they had a general abstract discussion that uh, you can construct operators that uh, allows to generate new solutions of the conformal work identities from old ones. And when you do that, you shift the dimension of the operators by plus minus one. And uh, this construction has been used in the cosmological bootstrap by the cosmological bootstrap uh, community as a way to generate solutions as a solution generating method. Uh, so if you uh, start from a specific seat correlator, which is easy to compute, then you can obtain other ones by acting with those. Um, but this operation also has subtleties. I mean, in, the, in this um, hard book uh, paper, we, we gave a new construction of this operators in momentum space. Uh, so the application is very subtle, the one renormalization is needed. And secondly, when you act on an exchange diagram, you generate both an exchange diagram and a contact diagram. So it doesn't, up, doesn't uh, act canonically in the space of different types of correlators. Um, so for some of, the th some of the things they've done, no, the majority of the formulas they give are correct because they're in a very special case. But generically, they, uh, one needs to uh, be very careful when you use these this methods. Uh, actually, in, in hindsight, it's easier to just compute them from scratch rather than using this method and taking care of the subtleties. And at the end, it's more work. Uh, OK, any questions on this? That could be another lecture on its own, actually. But, uh, Okay, so now last, yeah, maybe we can uh, spend 10, 15 minutes on that. Yeah? <coughs> yeah? 10 minutes? Okay. Okay, tensorial correlators. So, so this has been fully understood up to three point functions. And there are new issues because of uh, the subjects contain indices. Now, Lorentz invariance implies that the tensor structure can be carried out by tensors constructed from momenta and the metric. So we use this when I explain why we could solve the special form of work identity in momentum space. So if you have an object that has many indices, then the indices by Lorentz invariance can be carried out either by this or that. And this is something which has been used and uh, known and used for decades, I would say, from uh, in, in general quantum field theory. That's what people did, uh, you know, people write things in terms of form factors. And for low dimension operators, it's fairly easy to do it. You just write down all possibilities and then you work out the, uh, the implications. But the more indices you have, the problem, the more difficult the problem become. Uh, and you really need an optimal parametrization in order to solve this problem. It quite quickly becomes very complicated. <clears throat> so if you use an optimal parametrization, then uh, what, what that does for you is allows you to describe the correlators in terms of scalar form factors, and then you have equations satisfied by those. Um, yeah, let me skip this and that. And uh, yeah, so here I say when you have diffeomorphism, uh, diffeomorphisms of Valois identities, this allows us to express correlators that involve this object in terms of correlators without these insertions. I mean, for instance, if you have uh, the insertion of the divergence of the energy momentum tensor in this three point function is equivalent to two point functions, just the energy momentum tensor. And similarly, if you have a trace, the trace just is, is given by two point functions. So this means that uh, 
by using the diffeomorphism and Valwart identities, we can write down the three-point function in terms of lower-point functions plus a piece which is transverse and traceless. So now, we'll, so at this step, we're going to try to now solve the problem of finding what are the solutions for what for for this object which is explicitly traceless and uh, conserved. <clears throat> because the rest, we already know what they are. So if I know the general structure of this, then I put it in this formula, and then I get the general answer. So, okay, it remains to find this, this piece. <clears throat> now that we know that this is transverse and traceless, we also know we can try to input that into the formalism. So then uh, the answer, whatever it is, it should be, it should contain a projection operator that uh, projects into uh, transverse and traceless. And then the rest of the indices are, uh, <coughs> then, now the rest you can uh, write down the, the general expression that it could appear. So in this case, we see that there's only one form factor that we need. So if you try to do this for uh, three-point functions, if you use this method I'm describing here, this requires kind of five of those scalar coefficients. Where previously, when people tried to solve the same problem for three-point functions without going the steps I just described, they found that you needed to use 13 form factors. So suddenly you go from five equations to 13 equations and try to diagonalize and solve that system becomes completely intractable, so they have not uh, managed to, uh, to do anything with it. They wrote down, there's a long uh, paper with long equations that they didn't know how to diagonalize. Uh, well, here we'll see we can completely solve the problem. Now, once you've done this, then you need to impose dilatation and special conformal word identities. So the dilatation word identity implies that uh, the form factors are homogeneous functions of momenta of specific degree. And the special performer word identities give rise to two different types of equations. <coughs> what we call primary word identities. So we, this we can solve and obtain the form factors up to constants. And then there are second word, secondary word identities. And this imposes relations among the primary constants. Um, <coughs> so to go back to this example, so we had one uh, uh, one form factor, and then if you use this, the uh, the word identities, you get exactly the same equation we had earlier for the uh, scalar three-point functions. So this is exactly the same equation. So that has a solution in terms of uh, triple K integrals. So then the solution, this A1, is a triple K integral times a constant, which is the primary constant. And then the secondary word identity is now uh, is, is, is a first order uh, partial differential equation that relates that form factor with the two point function. And in this case, actually determines this factor alpha one in terms of the normalization of the two point function. So three point function of uh, energy momentum tensor and two scalars does not contain any new parameter which of course it was known in position space, but now we derived it in momentum space. Now, what is the general case? The general case for all systems takes the form I indicate over here. So, so you get an equation, which is uh, kind of lower triangular. So the top one is always the same equation that we get for scale of three-point functions. So it is the solution is given in terms of triple K. Now, once you solve the top equation, then uh, the second line is inhomogeneous equation where A1 enters. But now this equation here, one can use properties of triple K integrals to find a particular integral of that. And then this is again given in terms of triple K. Now you know A1, then you go to the next step, then you need both A1 and A2, but the meaning you can use them. So all solutions are given in terms of uh, triple uh, K integrals. So then if you have n form factors, <coughs> they have n primary constants. <coughs> and then the secondary word identities give relations among those and uh, among the, uh, the primary constants and the normalization of the two-point function. So that's the general story. Um, 
Yeah, let me see how much. Yeah, let's say this and then maybe I'm gonna skip to the end. <coughs> and perhaps the most interesting case is the case of the three energy momentum tensors. If you're in dimension greater than three, there are five four factors, therefore five primary constraints. And then uh, the water identity relates one of those to the normalization of the two-point function. So if we're, for instance, if we're in D equals four, we have two anomaly coefficients, A and C. C is related to this one. So if you give the anomaly, then that determines the three-point function uniquely up to one constant. And D equals three is special because uh, if you're in low enough dimensions, there's relations among um, <coughs> among the soil object. So you have uh, only two form factors rather than five. But that's a longer discussion. Let, let me skip that. Um, yeah, let's skip that as well. <coughs> in anomalies, the, I discussed quite a bit of anomalies in this lecture, but all of them are so-called type two, type type B, in the sense that uh, the candidate terms had a scale dependence. <coughs> there is another anomaly, the so-called type A anomaly, and that comes with a more subtle mechanism, or you get a zero over zero. Uh, and this is very similar to the way chiral anomalies appear. Uh, this appear because you have a so-called evanescent tensor, a tensor which is not zero in general dimensions, but becomes exactly zero in specific dimensions. That's how you get that zero. And the integral appears to be divergent, that, that you get the one over zero. But the ratios give, uh, give rise to the anomaly. Um, so it's been uh, 30 years, almost 30 years since that paper. But I think uh, this momentum space construction is the first concrete completely complete discussion about how to find the A anomaly in four dimensions. So. Okay. Good. This was quite quick. Uh, but uh, <laughs> let me now conclude. Um, so what I discussed today is the general solution of conformal what identities in the random space. We also discuss how to anomalize and the role of beta functions and anomalies. We discuss a number of subtleties which are often overlooked in the literature. Uh, what is the outlook? Uh, first, starting from uh, momentum space or ADS amplitude, so I can try to understand uh, flat space scattering amplitude by taking a flat space limit. And uh, that's something that is already quite a bit of literature, but that's something that uh, I think now that we have all of these general results, uh, it would be good to analyze it in complete generality. Uh, I, I, I am working on this. Um, also, I can use these results to early universe cosmology, and we'll discuss tomorrow a bit about early universe cosmology. Uh, so this is, in a sense, uh, near future outlook. The last piece that is really missing to have a complete general discussion is to have the general solution for tensorial endpoint functions, kind of the analog of the simplex, but now for any endpoint functions. Um, <coughs> that would require a bit of um, clever thinking of how to organize the computation. And of course, uh, once we built all of this, if we understand better the OPs and so on, uh, it would also be interesting to uh, set up the bootstrap program directly in momentum space and see uh, how all of this subtleties about anonymization might possibly enter in that discussion. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Analog of? Uh, BHZ? BHZ. Ah, yes. There are, there, there, are, uh, there are things that people have written down. There should be an analog. Uh, maybe there's more than what people have written down, but that's something that uh, 
it is explored right now. It, it is it, it is in a, a, an ongoing uh, research direction. Yes, yes, yes. Well, the beta term is there because you need to renormalize correlators. There's no way not to be there. Actually, it's in, 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 in hindsight, I don't see why people have not putting it there. Because the, again, uh, you have the fixed point, the beta function should vanish, but not the derivatives. And this is a derivative with respect to the sources. Uh, should be there, and it is there. When you do explicit computation, you actually see it. Thank you.